Hello, and welcome to Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, the podcast. Written by Eliezer Yudkowsky, read by Inyash Brodsky, based on the works of J.K. Rowling. First half of Chapter 74, Self-Actualization, Part 9, Escalation of Conflicts. Harry walked forward a step, then another step until a sense of unease began to pervade him, a disquiet in his nerves. He said nothing, lifted no hand. The pervading sense of unease would say it for him. From behind the closed door of the office came a whisper, carrying through the door as though no door were present. It is not my office hours, said that cold whisper, nor yet time of our meeting. I take ten quarrel points from you, and be glad it is not more. Harry stayed calm. Going through Azkaban had recalibrated his scale of emotional disturbances, and losing a house point, which had formerly rated 5 out of 10, now lay somewhere around 0.3. Harry's voice was likewise level as he said, You made a testable prediction, and it was falsified, Professor. I only wished to note that. As Harry turned to go, he heard the door opening behind him, and he swung back around in some surprise. Professor Quirrell was leaning back in his chair, his head lolling back against its rest as a parchment floated before him. Both the defense professor's hands rested limply on the desk, as though nerveless. He might have been a corpse, except that the ice-blue eyes still moved, back and forth, back and forth. The parchment vanished and was replaced by another so quickly it was like the material had only flickered. Then the lips moved as well. And from this, whispered the lips, you infer what, Mr. Potter? Harry was shaken by the sight, but his voice stayed even as he said, That ordinary people do not always do nothing, and that Hermione Granger is in more danger from Slytherin House than you thought. The lips curved ever so barely. So you think I have failed in my grasp of human nature, but that is hardly the only possibility, boy. Do you see the other? Harry furrowed his brows as he stared at the defense professor. I tire of this, the defense professor whispered. You will stand there until you see it for yourself, or else leave. As though Harry had stopped existing, the defense professor's eyes looked back to the parchment, once more scanning back and forth. It was six parchments later that Harry saw it, and said out loud, You think your prediction failed because there was some other factor at work which was not in your model. Some reason why Slytherin House hates Hermione more than you realized. Like when the orbital calculations for Uranus were wrong, and the problem wasn't in Newton's laws, it was that they didn't know about Neptune. The parchment vanished and was not replaced. The head rose from its lolling position then, facing Harry more directly, and the voice which issued forth was quiet, but not toneless. I think, boy, Professor Quirrell said softly, but in something approaching his normal voice that if all Slytherin House hated her so much, I would have seen it. And yet, three formidable fighters of that house did something rather than nothing, at risk and at cost to themselves. What force could have moved them or willed their motions? The icy blue glitter of the defense professor's eyes met Harry's own gaze. Some hand possessed of influence within Slytherin, perhaps then how would that hand have benefited itself by harm done to the girl and her followers? Um, it would have to be someone threatened by Hermione somehow, or someone who would get the credit if she was hurt? I don't know anyone who fits that profile, but then I don't know much about anyone in Slytherin outside first year. The thought was also coming to Harry that deducing a hidden mastermind from a single, mildly unexpected attack seemed like insufficient evidence to support the prior improbability of the theory. But then, it was Professor Quirrell who was doing the deducing. The defense professor was just looking at Harry, eyelids slightly lowered as though in impatience. And yes, said Harry, I am sure that Draco Malfoy isn't behind it. A hiss of outward air, like a sigh. He is the son of Lucius Malfoy, trained to the most exacting standards. Whatever you have seen of him, even in what seem to be unguarded moments when his mask slips and you trust that you have seen the truth beneath, 
Even that may all be part of the face he chooses to show you. Only if Draco successfully cast Patronus Charm as part of keeping up the act. But Harry didn't say that, of course. Instead, he just grinned slightly and said, So either you've really never read Draco's mind, or that's just what you want me to think. There was a pause. One of the hands turned over, beckoned a finger. Harry stepped into the room. The door closed behind him. That was not something you should have said aloud in human speech, said Professor Quirrell's soft voice. Legilimency? On Malfoy's heir? Did Lucius Malfoy learn of it, he would have me assassinated outright. He would try, Harry said. It should have won a crinkle of Professor Quirrell's eyes, but the defense professor's face was unmoving. But sorry. When the defense professor spoke again, his voice had once more become a cold whisper. I suppose I could, and pity the assassin. His head fell back against the chair, lolled to one side, the eyes no longer meeting Harry's. But these small games hardly hold my interest as they stand. Add legitimacy, and it ceases to be a game at all. Harry hardly knew what to say. He'd seen Professor Quirrell in an angry mood once or twice before, but this seemed emptier, and Harry didn't know what to say to it. What's bothering you, Professor Quirrell? He could not ask. What does hold your interest? Harry said a few moments later, after he'd worked it out as a safer-seeming strategy for redirecting Professor Quirrell's attention to positive things. Citing experimental results about keeping a gratitude journal as a strategy for improving life happiness didn't seem like it would be taken well. I will tell you what does not hold my interest, said that icy whisper. Grading ministry-mandated essays does not hold my interest, Mr. Potter. But I have undertaken the position of defense professor at Hogwarts, and I will see it through to its end. Another parchment appeared in front of Professor Quirrell's head, and his eyes began to scan it. Reese Belka held a high position in my armies before her folly. I will offer her the chance to stay rather than being expelled, if she tells me exactly of the forces which moved her. And I shall make it clear to her what will happen if she lies. I do permit myself to read faces. The defense professor's finger pointed past Harry toward the door. But whether you were wrong about human nature, or whether there's some extra force at work in Slytherin House, either way, Hermione Granger is in more danger than you predicted. Last time it was three strong fighters, so what happens after... She wishes not my help, nor yours, said a soft, cold voice. I no longer find your concern so entertaining as I once did, Mr. Potter. Go. Somehow, even though they were all equals and she definitely wasn't in charge, it was always Hermione who ended up speaking first in this sort of situation. The four tables of Hogwarts, the four tables having breakfast, were glancing over at where they, the eight members of Spew, had gathered off to one side. Professor Flitwick was also staring sternly at all of them from the head table. Hermione wasn't looking there, but she could feel Professor Flitwick's gaze on the back of her neck. Literally feel it. It was really creepy. Why'd you tell Tracy you wanted to talk to us, Mr. Potter? Said Hermione, her tone crisp. Professor Quirrell expelled Reese Belka from her army last night, Harry Potter said. And from all her other after-school defense activities. Do any of you see the significance of that? Miss Greengrass? Padma? Harry's eyes swept over them as Hermione exchanged a puzzled glance with Padma and Daphne shook her head. Well, Harry said quietly, I wouldn't actually expect you to, but what it means is that you're in danger and I don't know how much danger. The boy squared his shoulders, looking straight at Hermione's eyes. I wasn't going to say this, but I just wanted to offer to put you under whatever protection I could give. Make it clear to everyone that anyone who messes with you is messing with the boy who lived. Harry, said Hermione sharply. You know I don't want... Some of them are my friends too, Hermione. Harry didn't take his eyes from hers. And it's their decision, not yours. Padma, you told me that I owed you no debt for what I did, and that's the sort of thing a friend would say. 
Hermione broke her gaze from Harry to look at where Padma was shaking her head. Lavender, you fought well in my army, and I'll fight for you if you wish it. Thank you, General, Lavender said crisply. I mean, Mr. Potter. No, though, I'm a heroine in a Gryffindor, and I can fight for myself. There was a pause. Parvati? Susan? Hannah? Daphne? I don't know any of you so well, but it's something I would offer to anyone who came to ask it of me, I think. One by one, the other four girls shook their heads. Hermione realized what was coming then, but she didn't see a single thing she could do about it. And my loyal soldier, Chaotic Tracy. Really? Gasped Tracy, oblivious to the stabbing glares that Hermione and every other girl were directing at her. Tracy's hands flew artfully to her cheeks, though she didn't actually manage to blush, not that Hermione could see. And her brown eyes were, if not shining, at least open very wide. You do that? For me? I mean, I mean, of course, absolutely, General Chaos. And so it was on that very morning that Harry Potter went over to the Gryffindor table and then the Slytherin table and told both houses that anyone who hurt Tracy Davis, regardless of what she was doing at the time, would, quote, learn the true meaning of chaos, unquote. It was with considerable restraint that Draco Malfoy managed to prevent himself from slamming his head repeatedly into his plate of toast. They weren't exactly scientists, the bullies of Hogwarts. But even they, Draco knew, were going to want to test it. The Society for the Promotion of Heroic Equality for Witches hadn't announced it. It didn't seem like it would do any good to announce it. But they had all quietly decided, or, in the case of Lavender, been shouted into it by all seven other girls, to take a break from fighting bullies for a while, at least until their heads of house weren't looking at them quite so sharply anymore, and older students had stopped bumping Hermione into walls. Daphne had told Millicent that they were taking a break. And so it was with some puzzlement, a few days later, that Daphne looked at the parchment delivered to her at lunch, drawn in a hand so shaky it was almost unreadable, saying... Two this afternoon at the top of the stairs going up from the library. Really important. Everyone has to be there. Millicent. Daphne looked around, but she couldn't see Millicent anywhere in the great hall. A message from your informant? Said Hermione when Daphne told her. That's odd. I didn't. You didn't what? Said Daphne after the Ravenclaw girl had stopped in mid-sentence. The Sunshine General shook her head and said... Listen, Daphne, I think we need to know where these messages come from before we keep following them. Look at what happened last time. How could anyone have known where those three bullies would be, unless they were in on it? I can't say... Daphne said. I mean, I can't say anything, but I know where the messages come from, and I know how anyone can know. Hermione gave Daphne a look that, for a moment, made the Ravenclaw girl look scarily like Professor McGonagall. Uh-huh, said Hermione. And do you know how Susan suddenly turned into Supergirl? Daphne shook her head and said, No, but I think it might be really important that if we get a message saying we should be somewhere, everyone has to be there. Daphne hadn't seen what had happened with Susan after Daphne had tried to avert the prophecy by keeping Susan away. But she'd been told about it afterward, and now Daphne was afraid that... she might have possibly... might possibly have broken something. Uh-huh, said Hermione, who was doing the McGonagall stare again. Nobody seemed to know where it had started, who had started it. If you tried tracing it afterward, tracked it back word by word and mutter by mutter, you probably would have found it all going in a huge circle. Peregrine Derrick was tapped on his shoulder as he left potions that morning. Jamie Astorga heard a whisper in his ear at lunch. Robert Jugson III discovered a tiny folded note under his plate. Carl Sloper overheard two older Gryffindors whispering about it, and they gave him significant glances as they walked past. Nobody seemed to know where the word began or who had first spoken it, but it named the place, and it named the time, 
and it said that the color would be white. Every single one of you had better be absolutely clear on this," said Susan Bones. The Hufflepuff girl, or whatever strange power had possessed her, wasn't even pretending to act normal any more. The round-faced girl was striding through the halls with a firm, confident gait. If we get there and there's just one bully, that's fine. You can fight them in the regular way. My mysterious superpowers won't activate if there are no innocents in danger. But if five seventh-year bullies jump out of a closet, you know what you do? That's right. You run away and let me fight them. Finding a teacher is optional. The important thing is that you run away as soon as I create an opening. In a fight like that, you are liabilities. You are civilian targets. I have to worry about protecting. So you will get away as fast as possible, and you will not try to do anything heroic. Or so help me, the hour you get out of your healer's beds, I will personally show up and kick your asses right back in. Are we clear on that? Yes, squeaked most of the girls. Though in Hannah's case, it came out. Yes, Lady Susan. Don't call me that. Snapped Susan, and I don't think I heard you, Miss Brown. I'm warning you. I have friends who write plays, and if you do anything dumb, posterity will remember you as Lavender, the amazing stupid hostage. Hermione was beginning to worry about just how many other Hogwarts students besides Harry had mysterious dark sides, and whether she was likely to develop one if she kept hanging out with them. All right, Captain Bones," said Lavender in an unusually respectful tone, as they turned another corner along the shortest way to the library, passing through a rather large corridor studded with six sets of double doors, three sets on either side. Can I ask if there's any way for me to become a double witch? Sign up for the Aura Preparation Program in your sixth year. It's the next best thing. Oh, and if a famous Aura offers to oversee your summer internship. Just ignore anyone who warns you that he's a terrible influence, and you're almost certainly going to die. Lavender was nodding rapidly. Got it. Got it. Padma, who hadn't actually been there last time, was giving Susan very skeptical looks. Then Susan suddenly stopped in place, and her wand snapped up, and she said, "Protego Maximus." A jolt of adrenaline went through Hermione. She was instantly drawing her wand and spinning around. But she couldn't see anything wrong through the greater blue haze now surrounding them all. The other girls, who had likewise pulled into formation, were also looking puzzled. Sorry, sorry, girls. Give me a minute to check this place out. Thinking of a certain person has just reminded me that this hall we're in right now, with all these doors, would be an excellent place for an ambush. There was a moment of silence. Now said a harsh male voice, blurred into unidentifiability by a buzzing undertone. All six sets of double doors slammed open. White robes filed silently forward, all concealing white robes without marks of house affiliation and white cloth hiding the faces behind the hoods. They marched out and marched out, crowding the great corridor in numbers too high to count easily. Less than fifty robes, probably, certainly more than thirty. All of them already surrounded by blue haze. Susan said some extremely bad words, so awful that at almost any other time Hermione would have noticed. That message. Daphne cried in sudden horror. It wasn't from. Miss Bolstrode said the voice and its buzzing undertone. No, it wasn't. You see, Miss Greengrass, if the same girl sends off a Slytherin message every day you fight a bully, pretty soon someone else will notice. We'll have a talk with her after we're done with you. Miss Susan said Hannah in a voice just starting to quaver. Can you be super enough to? Wands rose in many hands. There came a series of blinding flashes of green light, a massive volley of shield breakers. At the end of which there was no more protective blue dome surrounding them, and Susan had fallen to her knees, clutching her head. Barriers of solid blackness had sprung into being at both ends of the corridor. Behind the double doors that Hermione could see into, there were only unused classrooms, very dead ends. No, said the male voice with that buzz overlaid. She can't. In case you haven't noticed, you've gotten quite a lot of people very angry at you. And we have no intention of losing this time. All right, everyone, prepare to fire. 
The wands around the perimeter aimed again, low enough that their enemies wouldn't hit each other if they missed. And then another male voice, with a similar buzz accompanying it, suddenly said, Hominum Revelio. An instant later, there was another massive volley of shield breakers and hexes, fired on reflex at the suddenly revealed figure, shattering the shields which had almost immediately begun to form around it. And then, as that same figure fell to the ground, a stunned silence. Professor Snape, said the second voice. He's the one who's been interfering? It was the potions master of Hogwarts who now lay unconscious on the stone floor, the dirt-spotted robe stirring for a final moment before they settled in place, his fallen hand outstretched toward where his wand was slowly rolling away. No, said the first male voice, now sounding a bit more uncertain. Then it rallied. No, that can't possibly be it. He heard us passing the word, of course, and came along to make sure nobody screwed it up again. We'll wake him up afterward and apologize, and he'll memory charm the children so they don't remember. He's a professor, so he can do that. Anyway, we should make sure we're really alone now. Veritas Oculum! Fully two dozen different charms must have been spoken then but no more invisible people showed up. One of them in particular made Hermione's heart sink. She recognized it as the charm which had been listed alongside the description of the true cloak of invisibility, which would not reveal the cloak, but would tell you whether it or certain other artifacts were nearby. Girls, whispered Susan. She was slowly pushing herself to her feet, though Hermione could see her limbs swaying and quivering. Uh, girls, I'm sorry for what I said before. If you've got anything clever and heroic to try, you might as well try it. Oh, yeah. Tracy Davis said then, her voice trembling. I almost forgot. Hey, all of you! Hey, are you planning to hear me too? Yes, actually, we are. I'm under Harry Potter's protection, you know. Anyone who tries to hurt me will learn the true meaning of chaos. So are you going to let me go? It should have sounded defiant. It came out sounding terrified. There was a pause. Some of the hoods of the robes turned to face each other, then turned back to face the girls. Hmm. Hmm. No. Tracy Davis put her wand away into her robes. Slowly, deliberately, she raised her right hand high in the air and pressed her thumb and forefingers together. Go ahead. Tracy Davis snapped her fingers. There was a long, awful pause. Nothing happened. Yes, well, said the voice. Tracy said, her voice sounding even higher and shakier, A cat among death is some. Her hand, stretching up still further, snapped its fingers a second time. A nameless chill went down Hermione's spine then. A frisson of fear and disorientation like she just felt the floor tilt beneath her, threatening to spill her into some darkness lying beneath. What's she? Began a buzzing female voice. Tracy's face looked pale, twisted with fear, but her lips moved, spilled forth sound in a high chant. Mabra! Behind Mabra! A chill wind seemed to spring up within the confines of the corridor, a dark breath that caressed their faces and touched their hands with ice. Fire at her on my count, shouted the leading voice. One, two, three! And maybe forty voices roared spells, creating a huge concentric array of fiery bolts that lit the whole corridor brighter than the sun for the short moment before the bolt struck and vanished upon a dark red octagon that appeared in the air around the girls and then disappeared a moment later. Hermione saw it. She saw it, but she still couldn't imagine it. She couldn't imagine a shielding charm that powerful, a spell that would withstand an army. And Tracy's voice went on chanting, her voice sounding louder and more confident, her face screwed up like she was trying to remember something very exactly. Shuffle, duffle, muzzle, muff. Fisto, whistle, miss a cuff. Now all those present could feel it. Heroines and bullies alike. The sensation of some dark will pressing down on them. A tingling in the air as something built and built and built. 
All the blue hazes around the white robes, all the shielding spells, had died out without any visible hex touching them. There were more flashes of light as more desperate spells were fired, but they fizzled out in mid-air like candle flames touching water. The black barriers at the two ends of the corridor had dissipated like smoke beneath the growing pressure, but their evaporation revealed the exit sealed, blocked by tiled slats of dark metal that looked stained as though with blood. And as Tracy chanted, a dreadful blue light began to shine out from beneath the metal slats and between them, and the six sets of double doors slammed shut all at once, as panicked white-robed bullies began to pound on them and howl. Then Tracy's hand slashed to her left, and she cried, Karma! Then her hand pointed below her, and Slanath! Above her, Naga! And then to her right, Tshishishi! Tracy paused, took a deep breath, and Hermione found her voice and cried, Stop, Tracy, stop! But there was a strange, wild smile on Tracy's face. She raised her hand still higher and snapped her fingers a third time. And when she spoke again, beneath her high girlish voice, there was an undertone as though some lower chorus were chanting along with her. Darkness beyond darkness, deeper than pitchers black, buried beneath the flow of time. From darkness to darkness, your voice echoes in the emptiness, unknown to death, nor known to life. What are you doing? Shrieked Parvati, and the Gryffindor girl stretched out a hand as though to pull down the Slytherin, who was now starting to float upward into the air. And both Daphne and Susan grabbed Parvati's arm at the same time, and Daphne cried out, Don't! We don't know what will happen if the ritual's interrupted. Well, what happens if it gets completed? Screamed Hermione, as close as she'd ever come to total brain meltdown. Susan's face was white as chalk, and she whispered, I'm sorry, Mad-Eye. And Tracy spoke on, her body floating higher and higher off the floor, her black hair whipping wildly around her in the chill winds. You are now the gate! You are the gate! You the guardian of the gate! I bid you open the way for him, and manifest his power before me! Chapter 4 The Corridor Was Plunged Into Darkness Chapter 5 Hermione Was Sorry The corridor was plunged then into utter darkness and silence, so that only Tracy could be seen and heard like there was nothing left in the universe except her and the light illuminating her from some nameless source. The shining girl raised her hand one final time and with dreadful gravity pressed her thumb and forefingers together. And within the darkness Hermione looked at Tracy's face and saw that the Slytherin girl's eyes were now, to the exact shade, the green of Harry Potter's. Harry James Potter doesn't friends! Harry James Potter opens for us! Harry James Potter opens for us! There was a snap like thunder. And then... End first half of chapter 74. Thank you to the following people. Hermione Granger, Anonymous. Daphne Greengrass, Jesse Cotton. Tracy Davis was voiced by Luppy. Lavender Brown by Paige Smith. Hannah Abbott, Mars. Padme and Paravati Patil by Amanda Grisello. Lauren Housley as Susan Bones. Millicent Bullstrode by Gigi Arndt. This chapter's original text, production notes, and attribution links, along with archives and much more, can be found at hpmorpodcast.com. If you would like to learn more about the art of rationality, please visit LessWrong.com, an online community of aspiring rationalists founded by Eliezer Yudkowsky. Some sound effects used are courtesy of the Free Sound Project. The music used is Catch That Goblin by Skaven. Thank you for listening, and come back next week for the conclusion of Chapter 74, Self-Actualization, Part 9, Escalation of Conflicts.